So I'm going to take a very brutalist approach to complex and complicated systems, uh, highly utilitarian, and you'll probably um, probably see from my approach why that's that's the case. By background, um, I first started becoming interested in notionally emergent behaviours probably about 16 or 17 years ago, um, when I was I began became aware of these things called serial automata, and they looked to be quite interesting models of computation. And subsequently, two or three years later, I became CTO of a company that was developing switching systems that exploited particular properties of cellular automata to make them um, more amenable to dependable systems, uh, systems analysis. More recently, and over the last uh, five years, I've split my time approximately 50% between the rarefied world of uh, Hewlett-Packard laboratories and the gritty, rather nasty world of services, real customers and, and real problems. And I hope some of that is going to come out, uh, come out today. The work I'm going to talk about, or the, the approach I'm going to talk about, also actually uh, relies on work by, by one of my uh, uh, primary colleagues, Chris Toff. So um, Chris isn't here, but... So I'd like to say something about complications versus complexities. So we're already well aware that constructed systems are big, they're difficult to manage, uh, in fact they're far more difficult than most humans can manage, even relatively small systems. And I've spent the last week with two very large European banks attempting to work out how they can demonstrate that in this world of complicated systems, they are going to be able to uh, demonstrate Sarbanes-Oxley compliance. An inability to demonstrate Sarbanes-Oxley compliance will be excessively serious for any company wishing to do uh, work in the United States. And incidentally, we came away from the week thinking it's an even bigger problem than we've, uh, we, we thought it was to, uh, to begin with, but we've made a start. But in fact, taking um, uh, or removing control from humans is, is actually very rational because humans have got this notion of very limited uh, response rate. Uh, they're not good at repeated operations. I mean, one of the few things computers are actually good at is doing the same thing over and over again until you take the, uh, pull the plug. Human beings are expensive to, to maintain, especially when they're bored, and especially when you need lots of them to get your response rate up. They're difficult to train, and so we seek to replace them wherever appropriate. But what do we replace them with? Well, we replace them with something that manages, because to some extent, every human is a self-managing system. And it's worthwhile asking, what exactly is a self-managing system? We're just reminding ourselves what they are. Well, in engineering terms, they're closed-loop control systems. So you make some sort of observation, um, and that observation tells you something about your existing state. It won't tell you everything. You can't measure everything. You may not want to measure everything. Self-managed systems have some ability to control some of the aspects of their behavior. So your, your, your autopilot within, a, uh, within an aircraft can control some aspects of its own behavior, but can't control the, uh, the external environment. They've got the ability to compute how to get from this state to that state, whether that's an implicit or an explicit set of operations doesn't really worry me just at the moment. But the essence, the, the really important thing is that conventional control systems require, if they're engineered, and if you talk to any control engineer, require that someone is able to demonstrate to some degree of certainty that what you've actually set out to achieve is what you actually intended to achieve. There's no point in putting a control system with that, or a controller which has got properties that are poorly defined because otherwise uh, you're not going to achieve the, the end result in many of the systems that I am particularly interested in. I will certainly take the, uh, the reasonable point that sometimes we choose to use excessively cheap controllers in objects which don't really matter very much. But for most of the systems I'm concerned about, once upon a time they were real-time systems, now they're big banking systems, big managed service product, projects, 
it's actually quite important that we do understand the, the nature of our controller. So, again, it's worthwhile asking, in the context of this controller, because it's the controller that's the heart of this self-managed system, which is what you want, what are the properties of good controller? Well, the first is convergence on a required solution over the whole input space. Uh, so this comes back to uh, talking about your edge of chaos. Well, actually, I hate talking about the edge of chaos. I want to understand that so I'm well, well away from that boundary and so that I can predict what the properties are going to be within the, the input range of, of interest. They require some means of some adequate responsiveness, and again, that means... I don't want to be able to say it's going to take me five seconds to, uh, to perform this action now, but it's going to take me two and a half hours so at some point in the future. We need to understand something about the stability of the solution on, on stable inputs, no unnecessary oscillations, which also means that we don't want snapovers on small changes. And generally, I think most control engineers, most conventional control engineers, would say, well, this is pretty well understood. Uh, they still manage to justify research budgets of one sort or another, but give them a few coupled um, uh, differential equations, and they're, they're as happy as lambs. So the question I'd like to ask is, what should replace this approach if we're going to derive control system properties in a complex setting? So if you have got something with a complex nature and you're dropping it into the system, what do you do about it? And as a fundamental question that's got to be asked, uh, your man on the moon uh, has somewhat different, uh, a somewhat different observation of his susceptibility to failure than uh, somebody playing with a, a toy robot uh, back on Earth. And we really do need to ask ourselves the question, should we... This is philosophically, this is morally, this is practically. Employ control systems which we cannot analyze. Should we actually insist that we restrict ourselves to mathematically tractable controllers, things that are understood? It's a very good question, and I think if you talk to the guys at Airbus Industries, uh, they're certainly really going to go for, uh, for the we want to analyze it. But actually, I might talk suggest there are two, two potential approaches, and I'm going to talk about, uh, about one of them. One is to take the Airbus Industries approach. Understand enough about the system that they're trying to control, enough about the uh, numerics of the algorithms that they're using to be able to justify with a very, very high confidence that they will, receive, they will achieve stability. It doesn't always happen. There are going to be, uh, be blackouts, so in the case of Airbus, um, there is obviously uh, problems to do with, with wind shear on, air, on, um, on runways, and so you have to introduce additional, not necessarily control, but certainly uh, higher level meta control in order to prevent an aircraft attempting to land outside of the parameters of its control system. But there is another approach, and that is to limit the measure response function so that they're actually known to live in stable areas. And that's what I'd like to, uh, like to talk about now. The example I'd like to take is the Humble Cellular Automata. It's been around, I think it was, uh, it wasn't von Neumann who first got there. I think he was an Austrian who got there. But uh, he was uh, somewhere uh, in, the, uh, in the Alps, uh, unable to publish. So I think von Neumann uh, got, uh, got his name down, down first. But they're essentially simple, locally connected structures. They're, they're not say well understood, they've certainly been explored by many, many people. And they have simple transition rules, which are based on recent state and recent neighboring states. So you communicate with your neighbors and you do something based around uh, what your, your neighbors did uh, at some stage in the past. The game of life is the classic one that uh, I think most people have seen. They're often considered to demonstrate emergent behaviors because you get patterns of some of which is extremely complicated. Um, sometimes it's chaotic. And they're widely used as models for, for load balancing. In fact, that's uh, computers and communication systems. And that's why I became in interested, because at the time, 17 years ago, I was involved in building 1,000-node um, multiprocessors. And we really haven't got the faintest idea how to 
schedule and develop uh, jobs that, that would, uh, would work on these. But all is not rosy. If we use conventional computing and communication structures to construct CA-like uh, objects, then we end up with four basic behaviors. Um, I say these are descriptive behaviors. Uh, I would be more than happy to, uh, to say that this is actually a, um, this is more of a lies to small children distinction between the different behaviors and a real distinction. But essentially, we get behavior in which we get some evolution to a homogeneous state. Everything just flattens out. Everything goes to one. Uh, we get evolution to some simple uh, periodic structures, so waves, for example, uh, continuously propagating at a constant rate uh, through the medium. But then we get these two rather more interesting behaviors from the point of view of research, the generation of uh, aperiodic chaotic behavior and the generation of complex patterns of very localized structures which, for one reason or another, don't propagate. And this gives us this whole problem of backward and forward, and where do you make your gamble, and why do you make your gamble if you're going to base something around this apparently very simple structure. The forward problem actually is not too bad. Um, reversibility, all of the, the properties that people who look at CA um, can be observed, um, well, observation-based analysis gets you quite a long way. The reverse problem, however, is the problem that the engineer has got. I want an object, locally connected object, that is going to behave in this way. Design me one. And for many of these CA, many of these, these complicated systems, the only way you can do that is through trial and error. You have got massive state spaces, so you don't necessarily understand how much of the state space you have gone and, uh, gone and looked at. And you end up with a possibly uh, simulations which, which haven't explored adequately the state space that you need to understand in order to get this right. Some successful commercial systems lie in zone one or two, but there are some massive implications. The domino effect. Approximately 17 or 18 years ago, uh, there was a massive US East Coast telecommunications failure. One or two switches failed, Cascade faults um, uh, resulted, and uh, Bell were taken out for the best part of 18 and a half hours. More recently, um, a combination of uh, power and control cascade faults had a devastating effect on the, uh, on the United States. And, in fact, modern communications uh, construction, at least for fixed infrastructure, mandates as part of the, uh, part of the um, uh, FCC that you can demonstrate dampening, the dampening of oscillations in the form of, uh, of load or, uh, or failure. So, a few conclusions, and why should we be interested in that? The first is that I believe that taking a dependability-based engineering approach to the design and construction of these systems mandates understanding. If you don't have the understanding, if you are simply doing, as unfortunately so many people I see within the complex systems world, simply doing uh, simulations and then hoping that that simulation is going to give you a reliable, repeatable structure, you're much mistaken and you're going to be laughed out of court when it comes to implementing that in a large financial, financial house. They don't like it. Many, many large systems are simply too important to leave open to chaotic behavior. And the systems that we are now looking at at the moment, I believe at the moment 70% of the UK GDP is generated through service economy type uh, activities. Of that, maybe 18 or 19% is highly dependent on highly integrated human computer process and physical structures. I probably don't need to tell most people that uh, fails. Um, it's very expensive. Um, everybody gets extremely upset. We don't hear very much of the commercial commercial failures because the supplier doesn't want to admit too much. The supplier admitted 
down their share price, person, business, doesn't want to do too much, doesn't want to say too much because if it was, uh, it was known that their um, business was suffering through the, the development of inefficient or unreliable systems, then their share price would, would drop as well. So finally, I think that the challenges of specifying, building, and managing what we've got at the moment are massive. Um, at the moment, we are seeing that these constructed systems are the most complex systems the world has ever seen. The connectivity, it means that you can't leave them alone to emerge. You need to be able to control boundaries, identify boundaries, control boundaries, understand the probabilities involved in different failure modes or different success modes and be able to bet on them appropriately. I do think that the exploitation of large-scale emerging phenomena has got some role to play, um, no doubt about that, but I think we've got to be very, very careful about getting carried away here and promising the earth too soon. The Artificial intelligence community did a very fine job of that. Now, admittedly, at the time, I was largely based um, in uh, either in Boston or up in Edinburgh, and both uh, universities, you're laughing, Bernardo, both universities had very aggressive AI programs. They took enormous sums of money out of government, out of the military, out of, out of anybody who was prepared to uh, come in with a checkbook. And there were some early successes, and it looked absolutely great. But then they suddenly began to realize it was a little bit more complicated than they thought. They had to step back a bit, talk about fundamentals, and they had to think rather carefully, rather more carefully. Now, the approach that my team on a micro scale have been taking with H within HP comes back to the control system. Obviously, going back to the brutal, we are interested in First of all, not losing money. Uh, secondly, making lots of money. And thirdly, enabling our customers to be able to rely on the systems we construct, manage, and ultimately then have to take down or migrate into some other form. And so we've taken the approach by there's a, uh, this nebulous thing called system sciences, which in some of its philosophical uh, approaches appears to is somewhat similar to, uh, to complex sciences. It claims everything and says, well, at one end, it's going to be quantum chromodynamics, and that's going to explain why Fred went over and had a, a, a cappuccino uh, with uh, uh, extra milk two, in two days' uh, two days time. Um, we've instead said, OK, what we're going to do is take a notion of control systems, because all of our businesses are effectively control systems. We want to be able to understand what do we prod, why do we prod it, how do we prod it, in order to move it in a direction that we wish. Um, we will then say that services, of which many aspects are truly, truly complex, uh, services are examples of these systems. Where we can, we will bound complexity and put into place appropriate recovery mechanisms so we can move ourselves back into stable regimes, stable operating regimes. And we will then consider different aspects of those control of those, those systems, whether they be people and organization at one point, where there are some limits to what we can reason about. We can take Bernardo's work on uh, social interaction and knowledge management and say we wish to achieve X, apply it, apply some science and go and measure what happened, look for some feedback. Um, and then observe that was either good or that was not good, and that might be all we can achieve at one level of the management of this system, and at the other le the other part of the management of the system where we are plugging wires together, configuring microprocessors, deciding how many disks we're going to put in, what level of redundancy we need, we can be very, very much more precise. But we've got to accept there is going to be a continuum of different types of science playing, playing their roles, and we've got to accept that we need to be able to put boundaries in and understand how flexible those boundaries should be. I said I'd leave some room for questions and get you out for coffee on time. Okay, we've got one already. Yes, we've got one. Well, as you perhaps know, I'm an admirer of your work, so 
uh, and I like very much this approach. One thing I never had a chance to ask you since you are now on the spot by asking <laughs> is how generalizable are these engagements on a particular one? Okay. Because that's a very important question. I think it? it's, it's a very important question. So just, just to explain, um, about half of my work within HP laboratories is spent with customers and HP services. And half of my work is spent dreaming about things uh, in, the, in, in the lab itself. Some of it is in extremely generalizable. And so one of the things we've been attempting to do is educate our systems engineers to think in a systems way, apply appropriate mathematics, apply appropriate social engineering uh, methodologies. And we believe that at the moment, about 80% of the problems we're seeing can be solved by relatively low level training, relatively low level exposure to, to, to basic techniques. Uh, anything from basic Q theory at one point to basic organizational uh, theory at the other, and the interaction between, let's say, systems theory and, uh, and, and the two. There is, however, 20% of problems, uh, the problems that we're coming up against uh, in terms of either attempting to bound complexity or attempting to understand the dynamics of particular systems in which we're stumped. We can go and get somebody, a bright mathematician or a bright economist, <coughs> to explain it as a one-off. But attempting to generalize and then move back from that general explanation to something, something new is extremely difficult. I think philosophically, this, this has always been a problem with engineered systems. Uh, engineers find it very easy to explain a specific instance of something. Uh, generalizing it becomes more difficult. Computer scientists, on the other hand, have got very, very abstract generalizable solutions which become completely intractable as soon as you attempt to scale them up and um, uh, apply them to some, something real. And it's not an easy, it's not an easy problem. We're learning quite a lot about what we, the way we should be applying this work, and hence this notion of quite distinct categories of systems uh, or system engineering that you need to do, which have to be linked. Uh, we're also understanding rather more about the need to allow multiple stakeholders in one of these groups to understand what an in the impact they, they have in one particular part of the, the, the system has on, on other parts of the system. So all too often, for those people who've done being involved in big systems projects, uh, I'm being a bit denigrating here, but you'll get somebody like McKinsey who comes in and says, you've got to re-engineer, and they'll throw some specifications and somebody like Accenture will say, we, got to, we need these systems. Who will throw some specifications at somebody called uh, HP, go and build it. And every time you do, you throw stuff, throw stuff at them, you throw away information. You lose information at each stage, and you lose the ability to, to link effect at one end to decision at the other. And so one of the, an interesting thing, I'm going back to social processes, one of the things that has emerged from the, the work that HP has been doing is something called rapid scenario planning, which is a formal mathematical um, underpinning of scenario planning discussions that place lang or use language which is appropriate to different groups of stakeholders so that they can, first of all, understand whether they actually understand it, understand whether they pass the right information forward or whether they're getting the right information back, and also understand the agility requirements of the system that they're going to wish to, uh, to put into place. And it's led to slightly different approaches to the way we are with the new things. Uh, as you're spending a part of your time as a consulting scientist, uh, how often do you hear customers lamenting about uh, enterprise IT complexity? And what you're telling them? Um, I'm seeing fewer customers lamenting about IT complexity. And there's a very simple reason for that. They're giving it, outsourcing it to us. <laughs> I see many of them, and so that's, that's a simplification. I've now got a, I've now, I have a process. I wish to conduct this process. HP, IBM, whomsoever, it's your, your job. So actually we're seeing less. Internally, however, we're seeing far more cursing. And as soon as you move from simply selling people servers to selling people a more complicated system upon which there are complex stacks of uh, uh, both uh, basic software, business logic, and then notional business objectives which are written into this logic, uh, you, see, you begin to see the engineering teams lamenting it and 
HP has always been, I'll, I'll talk about HP, using the experiences in HP, because HP has always been a fantastic instrumentation company. It's where it started. And boy, we can measure anything, absolutely anything about your system. And I do remember uh, walking into a large ERP system, which we were trying to understand, and being told that they could collect almost a terabyte of instrumentation data every week. They could do it. What on earth did it all mean? And the analogy that I quite like to, to use is to say, if we wish to understand where we are going to invest in a country in order to increase the prosperity of that, of that country, we don't go and start by measuring the amount of traffic on the roads. That's an indicator of possibly greater prosperity in one area, greater commerce in one area. But it doesn't, if we, if we simply look at that and say, well, reducing congestion is obviously going to maximize our return, then you don't use the, that you, or using that metric is not going to get you a maximum return. You've got to look higher up. Once you look higher up and start taking the economic view, and think about the system as an economic control system, and then you begin to see that underneath that, there's a hierarchy of other control systems, all of which need to be appropriately instrumented. But if you've got the top-down abstraction, design top-down, build bottom-up has always been a, a favorite saying of mine, and probably most other people as well, then you begin to get proper root cause analysis. That is, you can begin to understand what the impact on your high-level objectives are from, from what, what's happening below. I do believe that it's not just HP, but many of the large, successful service organizations are now taking a control-based approach in which they're, they're saying, right, here are my business objectives. Some of those business objectives, by the way, do mean that I understand my agility. Um, here are the sets of things I'm going to need to understand at the business level, the sets of things I'm going to need to understand at the process level, the sets of things I'm going to need to understand at the, at the IT level. And if you build appropriate abstraction interfaces as well, you've also got the ability to rip one layer out and replace it with another. Potentially run one in, uh, uh, concurrently with another, without having to work to disturb the electrical system. You just gave you a very beautiful example. Another example that could be too enthusiastic perhaps, but of having discovered a layer of abstraction that is relevant. If you care about your tire pressures, you don't need the whole theory of how rubber is reacting against the pavement. And any need that fails, as you said, does not crash the car necessarily. No. Okay. So I think that that's the issue. And whereas you were advocating a full spectrum of dynamics from the very, very micro all the way to the very macro, which might be an interesting intellectual exercise, but I, I wonder when you're trying to make these things do something, whether or not that's useful, as Richard is saying. I'm going to just take that as one last point. It's a very good one. Um, there is a term used in English called lies to small children. And so when you're teaching children about physics at when they're eight or nine, things are hard. And suddenly, things have got lots of space in them, or are these little balls. And there are these things, and that, that explains actually a little bit more about what it is they're trying to understand about the system. And then there are these little balls made up of other little balls with things whizzing around them. <coughs> and that explains a bit more. And you get to university and you realize it was all lies. But the important thing is that understanding building blocks was perfect for the kid at eight years old and allows that kid at eight year old, years old to understand the castle that they're building. But when they need to understand how to construct the uh, material that is going to be tough enough and chewable, they might wish to take a slightly more material science oriented view. And I think one of those points is, 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 is very, very sensitive. And we've talked about the equivalent within, the, within these models in terms of abstraction. What are the appropriate lies to small children? Because I think you could argue that our understanding of, our deep understanding of biology might actually have been damaged and held back by the fact that we have we had advanced our understanding of physics so far. And so the intention of, or the attempt by so many of the very good um, theoretical biologists to get right in there at the quantum chromodynamics level, I haven't seen any string theory approaches yet, but I'm sure they're coming, uh, is, is, is damaging. And possibly lies to small children is a way to go uh, as an applicable way of treating these complex systems. And systems.